Greetings and welcome. This is Junior English. And our objective now for the hour is to be working with uh, three uh, of our poets uh, in this section that we call the modernists. Now, I'm on page um, 920, 921 with you. And we're going to begin with the poetry of E.E. E. Cummings. And before we get here, I want to just make a quick reminder that next Tuesday, you must submit as your uh, packet number nine writing assessment, not an essay on modernist poetry, but an attempt to write an actual modernist poem. Okay, I believe that one's 935. If you want, you can flip there real quickly. Page 935 has a number of bullet points. Do you see them listed for you there? Your objective of next Tuesday's pay, uh, poem is you have to write a 10-line poem that features some of these characteristics of modernity. Not all of them necessarily, but some. And again, when you then hand in your poem to me, your 10-line offering, on your cover sheet for Packet 9, you're going to bullet point the reasons why this poem is what we would call a modernist offering. Got me? Now, you'll have studied some of um, poems that we call modernist poems. One of the important ones is T.S. Eliot's Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock. You'll be watching that one and studying that one in a lecture I gave online. Now the challenge for us is to take a look at E.E. E. Cummings. And as we start with Cummings, who is a really important American poet for us, I want to point out a couple of things right away. The first, maybe, has to do a bit with biography. You're looking at a picture of him there on page 920. But I would point out to you that Cummings, as I said to one of you already earlier today, Cummings has been with us all the while. He's actually been watching us, nonetheless. No kidding. Cummings is one of the few poets that makes it onto our wall in room 303, only because one of our students found him to be such an important poet that he made, he made the, the pictorial there that sits in the corner that's been watching us all the while. Cummings has been around with us all the time. Some of us didn't realize that's who he was and what that even means. We'll know more what that means here in a second. The second thing I'd like to point out is on page 921, and it has to do with this issue of form. Now, there's two ways to look at a poem. There's form and there's content. Content, of course, what the meaning of the poem is and the like. Form is the literal presentation on the page, the way your poem literally looks when you hit the print key and you print it out of your printer, okay? There is different experimental ways to play that game. Let's go ahead and say it out loud now. Cummings is one of our great experimenters. Okay, one of our great experimenters. He's always playing games with the language. He will do it intentionally. All right. Now, sometimes this is frustrating to some junior readers. They get, they get quickly frustrated with Cummings. What I would say about reading the poetry of Cummings is you've got to see it as more like a game. Okay? You can't take it so serious. You've got to see it as almost like an, an invitation to have a bit of fun. And if you take that attitude towards the work of Cummings, it usually is a little bit easier. It seems like your textbook company is trying to say that without saying it by giving you this image on page 923, which is kind of like a fun, almost childlike, right, uh, little uh, picture painting, uh, you know, for us. Now, anyone lived in a pretty how town? Well, that's an interesting title. Right away, some of us will say, that don't make no sense. And Cummings will say, just stick with me, pal, and let's get to the end of the poem. And you tell me if what I've written makes sense or it doesn't. Let's go ahead, though, and give you a few heads up. In this poem, you're going to have characters, but they're not going to be named normal names. Okay? Why, we may talk about in a moment. Anyone, right, the name of our male in the poem, and no one will, of course, be the name of our female. What's interesting, and for those of us who've grown up in small towns, we sometimes have a sense of this one, right? What's interesting is that these two, they don't seem to fit. They don't seem to fit. They don't seem to, 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 to be able to relate to the small community, small town life that they're stuck in. Nonetheless, though, this, these two characters... They live, they love, they grow old together, and eventually they die together, okay? Now the question for us will be, 
What point is Cummings making about small provincial towns? But also, what point is he making about love? Let's take a look at the poem. And then we'll obviously ask, why would he name the guy in the poem anyone? And why would he name the girl in the poem no one? And what is he saying about love? Let's take a look. Again, this is a modernist poem. We will not have read anything in the American poetic tradition like this poem. So when Cummings publishes this poem, this one, and many like it, uh, immediately people start to debate whether it's even poetry or not. Lots of people who are readers of his poems say, they don't make any sense. Let's take a look. We'll try and figure it out. Right away, looking at the poem lying on the page there, identify that we're looking at four-line stanzas, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Anyone lived in a pretty how town with up so floating many bells down, spring, summer, autumn, winter. He sang his didn't, he danced his dead. Women and men, both little and small, cared for anyone, not at all. They sowed their isn't, they reaped their same sun, moon, stars, rain. Children guessed, but only a few, and down they forgot as up they grew, autumn, winter, spring, summer, that no one loved him more by more. When by now in leaf by tree she laughed his joy, she cried his grief, bird by snow and stir by still, anyone's any was all to her. Someone's married their everyone's, laughed their cryings and did their dance. Sleep, wake, hope, and then they said their nevers, they slept their dream. Stars, rain, sun, moon, and only the snow can begin to explain how children are apt to forget to remember with up so floating many bells down. One day anyone died, I guess, and no one stooped to kiss his face. Busy folk buried them side by side, little by little, and was by was, all by all, and deep by deep. And more by more they dream their sleep. No one and anyone, earth by April, wish by spirit, and if by yes. Women and men, both dong and ding, summer, autumn, winter, spring, reaped their sowing and went their came. Sun, moon, stars, rain. Now, let's just point out right away, there's usually a personal response to an E.E. E. Cummings poem right away. I mean, just normally readers of these poems go, what? Like, dude, what did we just read? Now, it helps to know that the two characters of the poem are named anyone and no one, right? That kind of gives us a little bit of an insight to start to go back and look at this poem and go, okay, dude, what happened in this poem? The answer, of course, is what? In a line, what did happen in this poem? Yeah, in a line, it's life, isn't it? Well, what about life? What about life? They live in what kind of town? We might say sounds familiar, right? Where everyone knows everyone's business. Everyone has pretty limited ideas of what it is to be a good little girl or a bad little girl, right? These ideas are extremely limiting. Anyone meets no one. They fall in love, they live together, and then they die. Question, let's stick with to be and form. What is it that Cummings does in this poem that's experimental with his form? Make some observations. Some of you will play a game of trying to write a poem kind of like this as your modernist offering. What is it that right away you see is missing? Let's just start there. What's missing in this poem? Names. Names. Notice the punctuation, the syntax. The Do you see it? Only two periods. Notice the game of no capitalization. Notice that you have to read it and read it and read it again before you know where to take the breaks, right? So that it'll make any sense at all that you're, what you're looking at. And yet notice he still tries to play kind of a game of a closed form with four line stanzas. Did you see this, right? So it's, he's playing within classical traditions, but he's clearly very experimental. Let's point out that Cummings loves shock value. So that, for example, anyone lived in a pretty how town, a recapitulation of our title, 
with up so floating many bells down. What? Like, Bert, what does that even mean? Up so floating many bells down. Any idea what this even means? Why anyone lived in a pretty how town? What does how town mean? Of course, are you familiar with what out here in the West small towns were often called? Because there are so many ranchers. They were called cow towns. Right, right. So Cummings is playing an interesting game with us. If you know anything about small towns, they were often called cow towns, which was kind of an insult. That meant small, right, very provincial. With up so floating many bells down. What, you got any idea? You want to take a stab at what that one's about? With up so floating many bells down. I feel like it's kind of like people's dreams, but since they're in a small town, it doesn't really matter. Right, there you go. Notice the syntax. We're playing games, right? The ringing of bells and the, the, the idea of almost word pictures of balloons going up. That, they don't go up. Where do they go? Down. Spring, summer, autumn, winter. This seems to be a recapitulation over and over in the poem. What's, play, what's the game being played there? Life is passing. There you go. It's a year. It's another year. It's another year. It's another year. You know, it's, uh, as students, sometimes they'll leave Orland and they'll come back and they'll say, it feels like when I was here. It's like nothing's changed. It's like over and over and over. You see, small town. He sang his didn't. He danced his did. Any idea about what that's about? It's, it's a poetic way to say what about his life? He was different. Yeah, he did some things that were a little bit different from what everybody else did, right? Women and men, both little and small, cared for anyone, not at all. Uh-oh, what's this tell us? They didn't like him. Right, he doesn't fit in. In other words, anyone is kind of an outsider in a town of a bunch of people, okay? One... One is love. One, one loves him, and it is no one. no one. And, of course, that's a, that's a wonderful, wonderful duplicity, right? No one is in the name of the woman who he loves, but also it's a way to say nobody else in the town cared much for him. This is going to be a poem about two people who somehow find each other in the middle of the sea of conformity. That is to say, these are two nonconformists who die side by side. In some ways, this is just a pretty little love poem, right? Question, why would he have to write it this way? Why can't he just write a poem that's easily accessible? That right, in the very act of being a nonconformist in his poetic form, he is playing the game. In other words, for people who are so angered by his nonconformity, he will say, ironically, oh, I'm sorry, didn't, didn't mean to insult. You're one of those people who have to be like everyone else. I'll try and find another reader who has a soul. You can kind of see then the insult. It's a latent insult. And E.E. E. Cummings plays the game throughout his entire poetic career. He challenges readers to say, really? Why can't it be different? Why is it that different frightens us so much or angers us? A lot of students will read it and they're like, this is just dumb. They get angry about it. And Cummings has a way of saying to us, Really? Just because you live in a provincial small town, which, by the way, is every town, right? It's every town. It's every city. It's all the same. Uh, why, why not try and find your own voice? Your own did and your own didn't. Let's look at Marianne Moore's offering poetry. This is an interesting poem because it's going to critique poetry. Marianne Moore, a great American poet, is going to critique poetry. The very enterprise, of course, is critiqued in a poem. She'll begin by saying right away that she, too, dislikes poetry. She calls it a fiddle, right? Fiddle, faddle, that is to say nonsense, right? Some readers of poetry feel this way immediately. It's kind of silliness, this poetry crap. Why do we got to even look into all this poetry stuff? Later, however, in this poem, she will give some reasons to like poetry, especially if it is, we might say, genuine, different, imaginative, and as well as if there's, for Marianne Moore as a modernist, there's got to be something that links the poem to the real, something to the authentic. Poetry. I'm with you on 924. I too dislike it. 
There are things that are important beyond all this fiddle. Reading it, however, with a perfect contempt for it, one discovers in it, after all, a place for the genuine. Hands that can grasp, eyes that can dilate, hair that can raise if it must. These things are important not because a high-sounding interpretation can be put upon them, but because they are useful. When they become so derivative as to become unintelligible, the same thing may be said for all of us, that we do not admire what we cannot understand, the bat holding on upside down or in quest of something to eat, elephants pushing, a wild horse taking a roll, a tireless wolf under a tree, the immovable critic twitching his skin like a horse that feels a flea, the baseball fan, the statistician. Nor is it valid to discriminate against business documents and school books. All these phenomena are important. One must make a distinction, however, when dragged into prominence by half-poets. The result is not poetry. Nor till the poets among us can be literalists of the imagination, above insolence and triviality, and can present for inspection imaginary gardens with real toads in them. Shall we have it? In the meantime, if you demand on the one hand the raw material of poetry and all its rawness, and that which is on the other hand genuine, you are interested in poetry. Now, I wish I had more time to talk about this really genius poem. I mean, think about it. You've got a really famous poet who begins by saying, poetry sucks. See, already there's some irony here, right? Yeah, I don't like it either. She can almost like she can hear out loud somebody saying, poetry is a complete waste of time. And this really famous poet goes, yeah, I totally agree with you. Wait a minute, you're a poet and you totally agree with me? Right, because most of what's written is written by half poets and therefore not poetry at all. There's no real difference, it seems, between what they write and reading some essay out of a school book. Dot, 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 but, or dot, dot, dot. However, every once in a while, she says, you stumble across something that seems real poetry. That, she says, I can appreciate. Notice some of the word pictures here. The bat holding on upside down or in quest of something to eat. All of the things listed, elephants, wolves, these are all real things. We might say today, grounded in something real, right? And yet out of that, imaginary, notice it's in quotation marks, Imaginary gardens with real toads in them. It's a famous line. What do you think she means by that? The goal is to construct imaginary gardens with real toads in them. Something that has reality based in Yeah, something based in reality and yet somehow new. The great British poet who we will study next year as seniors, Shelley, will say in his classic defense of poetry that what great poets do is they take the most ordinary thing and they make it again look new. Some of you will walk the halls of Orland High School later today and that line, anyone lived in a pretty how town, and it will hit you how so many of us at Orland High School, yeah, we are such conformists. And to live in a pretty how town, any town, is a pretty how town. But to see it differently, Cummings has helped us to see it differently, Marianne Moore would say, there you go, that's what real good poets do. Let's go to the last offering, another modernist offering on 926 Ricardo. This is, of course, another example of modernist poetry that doesn't have to say anything other than what it says. That is to say, this poem is about two lovers who spent all night together, first riding on a boat, a ferry, eating some apples and pears together, and then giving some fruit and some money to a poor, poor woman. Let's, let's enjoy this one. Ricardo. We were very tired. We were very merry. We'd gone back and forth all night on the ferry. It was bare and bright and smelled like a stable, but we looked into a fire. We leaned across a table. We lay on a hilltop underneath the moon, and the whistles kept blowing, and the dawn came soon. We were very tired. We were very merry. 
We'd gone back and forth all night on the ferry, and you ate an apple and I ate a pear from a dozen of each we had brought somewhere, and the sky went wane and the wind came cold, and the sun rose dipping, a bucket full of gold. We were very tired. We were very merry. We'd gone back and forth all night on the ferry. We hailed, good morrow, mother, to a shawl-covered head, and bought a morning paper which neither of us read, and we wept, and she wept, God bless you for the apples and pears, and we gave her all our money, but our subway fares. Now, this the interruption hey, uh, students and staff, but if I can have your attention, please. This, um, last hour, third hour, we had a student uh, um, lost a substantial.